I'd love to get a couple of girls like you for my shows in Brooklyn. Do you ever come through New York? The girls are like, what? Come through New York? Nigga, that's where we from. We only down here in Miami visiting. We'll be home in a minute. love bugs hello there bellas if you have not already done so please remember to like share to facebook or twitter subscribe and visit uptopbeauty.com today's looky lookies would be our renee scarves i'm not sure what number this is we do still have a couple over there and they are on sale for $20. And I know some of you guys are like, nay, I love those glasses. I have just ordered some glasses that are pretty close to these. These are Tom Ford's. These are my uh, wife's glasses. So uh, you know that the price that they are is not going to be the price that I would sell them to you for because I would get something close to an authentic Tom Ford. I wouldn't get you a Tom Ford, but it would still give that look that you're looking for and if you are not already a part of this book club please hit the patreon link below and or the join button here on the youtube and for a small monthly fee of five dollars you babies yes you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the youtube gets it if the youtube gets it now let's continue talking about be My Baby by Ronnie Spector. We recorded four tracks at the first session. I Want a Boy and What's So Sweet About Sweet Sixteen. The two sides of our first single and I'm Gonna Quit While I'm Ahead and My Guiding Light. The two songs that eventually came out as our second single. I was only 17 years old, but I tried to handle myself as professionally as I could once we got into the studio. I made sure to write all the lyrics out by hand on a little sheet of but paper. back in the day, as a young person or adolescent, teenager, whatever it was, when I think back at it, I spent a lot of my life writing down the lyrics to songs. Why did we do that? Was it because when we sang the songs, we wanted it to be right? Or if somebody sang the song wrong, we could check them and be like, uh-uh. That didn't say tennis shoe. That said, get some glue. Were we that obsessed with songs and music as young people that we just had to know the words? Estelle and Nadra shared another mic with these two fat ladies, one white and one black. They sang like they thought they were the McGuire sisters or something, and I guess Stu Phillips thought we needed them to fill out our sound. We were just teenagers, and none of us had full church-trained voices like so many of the other black singers back then. All we knew was the three-part harmony we learned from Mr. Kamalucci. We had another session in the same studio about six months later, at the beginning of 1962. That's when we did our version of Silhouettes, which was already an oldie but goodie then. It had a simple three-part harmony, and we'd already done this song a hundred times at sock hops and bar mitzvahs. Great, I thought. Here's one we can do in our sleep. Boy, was I wrong. That was the day I found out that there's a big difference between singing a song at a sock hop and recording it to perfection in a studio. We just kept on singing the verses over and over again. Hold it, girls. Somebody in that modulation is still hitting one note and then changing to another note in the middle of the chord. Child, what? Modulation, chords, changing notes? Child, I wouldn't know what the hell Mr. Stu was talking about. What, Mr. Stu? She said she didn't know what he was talking about either, but they went on and they did it again. Modulations? Changing chords? What? That's for you singers to know and understand. We just looked at him blinking. It was like he was talking in a foreign language. Then we start another course only to have him stop us again. That's better, he'd say. But let's do it one more time. 
It was always one more time. Then she leaned into the microphone and said, why we got to do the same thing one more time? Can't we just do it one big time? Let's do it one big time. The producer was like, no, that's not how it worked, girl. What? Okay. We recorded five more songs before we finished the sessions. Besides Silhouettes, we did You Bet I Would, I'm on a Wagon, Good Girls, The Memory, He Did It Again, and The Thing Called Recipe for Love. They were all songs that Stu picked out for us. But if I'd had a say in it, I don't think I would have chosen most of them. When I Want a Boy came out in August of that summer, Estelle and I were so excited. We bought about a dozen copies for all the aunties and uncles. I think those might have been the only 12 copies sold in the city of New York. The record went zilch, and we were crushed. We called Mr. Halikas to ask him why our record wasn't being played on the radio, but he just told us to be patient for Christ's sakes, girls. Don't give up already. If the girls are feeling bad, imagine how the people feel that invested the money into the girls feel. Okay, you singing. I know you putting in the hard work, goddammit, but my money is going down the toilets, girl. But I think as an artist, you don't even think about that. Until them people be like, okay, you done made your money. I invested my money. So now you ain't going to get a dime because all that money I invested I need to recoup. Girl, that's called the good. So, although the girls are discouraged, Mr. Halikas is like, girls, it's okay. You know, not too many people hit with their first record, okay? Except for the new edition, Candy Girl Went Through the Roof. <laughs> we knew that our bar mitzvah days were coming to an end. They had to. We were a rock and roll group. And real rock and roll groups didn't play bar mitzvahs every Saturday. We decided that if we wanted to be taken seriously as rock and rollers, we had to stop hanging around sock hops and start moving where the rock and roll crowd went. And in 1961, the rock and roll crowd hung out at only one place, the Peppermint Lounge. During the height of the twist craze, the Peppermint Lounge was the in place to go in New York. Celebrities used to come from all around the world and line up around the block to get in there. And this wasn't just show business people. The Peppermint Lounge attracted everyone from painters to presidents. Since Nadra and I were still underage, we practically needed to disguise ourselves to get past the doorman. That's where having six aunts helped because they taught us all the tricks to using eyeliner, blusher, and lipstick. It's funny, but as protective as they were in most ways, mom and my aunts didn't seem to mind grooming us to get through the door of New York's steamiest nightclubs. Success to me is all about support. As long as you got somebody to believe in your dreams, you got it, baby. We took the subway down to the Peppermint Lounge, which was at 45th between 6th Avenue and Broadway, and got on the line in front of the place. Every so often, the doorman would walk out of the club to see if any celebrities were waiting, and when he saw us standing there with our wild hair, and matching yellow outfits, he figured we must be somebody important. So he walked back into the club and brought out the manager, an older guy who carried an unlit cigar in his hand. As soon as he saw us, he said, what are you doing out here in the line? You're already late. The girls is like, we already late. Okay, let's just go with it. <laughs> Let's go. Talking about opportunity. The owner of the club had hired some girls to dance in the club, like them go-go dancers. It's women that are hired to just dance around the club. That's it. Go-go dance. It didn't take us long to figure out that he'd hired a girl group to dance at the club, but they obviously hadn't shown up. Yeah, talking about fate. We were smart enough to know that when someone opened the door for you, you walked through it. I took a deep breath and turned to Nadra and Estelle. Okay, I sighed, let's go. Joey D and the Starlighters had already started playing 
when we walked in and the club was packed solid as we worked our way to the stage. Okay, the club manager said, you're dancers, so dance. We probably should have been scared out of our minds, but we weren't. All this guy expected us to do was to climb up on stage and dance. So we hopped up there and the minute we hit the stage, we knew we were going to be okay. Every eye in the place was on us. They noticed our looks right away, just like I knew they would. With everyone staring at me, it didn't take much effort to get charged up and dancing. Joey D and the Starlighters played straight through without missing a beat. We were sitting at a table during the break when the club manager walked over, still holding his cold cigar, and offered us a job on the spot. By this time, he knew we weren't the dancers he hired, but with crowd response like we got, who cared? The pay was $10 per girl per night, which sounded like a fortune. At least once a night, we'd get to do a number on stage with Joey D and the guys, which was my favorite time of all. I was still a senior in high school, so I had to get up bright and early for classes every morning. But I was usually so excited after I got home from the club that I couldn't even think of sleep. So some nights I'd take a couple of Salmonex to help me relax. I, Salmonex? What the hell is a Salmonex? Hold on, y'all. Is that a sleep medicine? And do they still make that shit? Because you know some of them drugs back then you can't take no more. Oh, it's a sleep aid. Or they still make that shiz. Mm. I take a couple of Somnex to help me relax. I was always on the go in those days. After we started dancing at the Peppermint Lounge, we decided it was time to change our name again. With all the exposure we were getting, we knew it was just a matter of time before people in New York started talking about us. And when we did, we didn't want them talking about a group called Ronnie and the Relatives. It just didn't have the magic. My aunts and uncles were tossing names around one night when my mother pointed out that the Bobettes and the Marvelettes had both had hits recently. That seemed to be a whole lot of ets going around, Mom said. Why don't we call them the Rondettes? Everyone in the room suddenly sat up. Yeah, said Nadra's mother, my aunt Susu. That's a good one. It's got a little piece of all three girls' names in it. We dropped the D and shortened it to Ronettes soon after that. No one seems to remember why. And that was the name that stuck. Okay, I'm confused because her name is Veronica. They call her Ronnie. So I'm thinking in my mind, how is the name the Ronettes a mixture of all three girls? Yes. I don't know. I don't get it. Because you got Nadra. That's an N. But so does... Ronnie, right after we got hired at the Peppermint Lounge, Columbia Pictures came down there to make Hey Let's Twist, a teenage dance movie that starred Joey D and the Starlighters. We were thrilled, of course, because we thought this would be our break too. The Starlighters loved us so much that Joey D and David Brigatti wanted the three of us to play their girlfriends in the movie. We even went down to the set to meet the casting director, but he took one look at our complexions and said, answer no. No, 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 no. The dude said, because they're race is so ambiguous it would cause controversy they're too light to be black but they're too dark to be white and we can't have that answer no our disappointment didn't last long by the beginning of 1962 we flew down to miami to open up the florida branch of the peppermint lounge joey and the guys knew how crushed we were after losing out on the movie parts so they offered to let us do the florida shows with them as a sort of consolation it was nice to get away from the new york winter for a few weeks but i think our mothers enjoyed their vacation even more than we did i was only 18 and nadra was even younger so mom and aunt susu 
had it written into our contracts that they would come along as chaperones. That was during the days of the civil rights struggle in the South, which was something we never even thought about coming from the North. The Miami Peppermint Lounge turned out to be as big as a hit as the one in New York. In fact, so many vacationing New Yorkers showed up there that sometimes it seemed like we'd never left home. That's probably why it didn't surprise us to see Murray the K backstage on opening night. Murray the K Kaufman was the disc jockey that all the kids listened to back home on WINS. He could make a record go number one faster than anyone in the country. And you knew you'd made it when he booked you on one of his rock and roll shows he staged at Fox Theater in Brooklyn. Having him come back to see us was like getting a visit from royalty. You kids are fantastic. I'd love to get a couple of girls like you for my shows in Brooklyn. Do you ever come through New York? The girls are like, what? Come through New York? Nigga, that's where we from. We only down here in Miami visiting. We'll be home in a minute. 